like to reflect with you on the conclusion to the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, the last of the antitheses, taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, uh, which is the Gospel uh, for Tuesday of the 11th week of ordinary time. Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So in this sixth and final antithesis, Jesus' message is clear. Love has primacy. He begins by quoting Leviticus chapter 19, verse, verse 18. You shall love your neighbor. He continues, but hate your enemy. But actually the scriptures never say hate your enemy. But Jesus is referring to the common mentality or attitude of his day. Enemies, particularly the enemies of Israel, were to be hated because they were opposed to the true God. Thus we see in the Old Testament, the Israelites wage war on the inhabitants of Canaan or on the Amalekites. But now Jesus radicalizes or intensifies the commandment to love one's neighbor by challenging his disciples to love their enemies. Effectively, Jesus is saying, love knows no bounds. If you want to be my disciple, your love must be without limit. Jesus is again challenging his disciples to go beyond what the tax collectors and the pagans do. He's calling them to love their enemies. Recall that he had told them, um, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Think about our, uh, think about how this, this, this commandment to love your enemies. Think about how hard it is, seemingly impossible for us to do. How difficult would it be in this political climate where we have polarization in our nation to love our enemies? How difficult is it for Republicans to love Democrats and Democrats to love Republicans? Is not our natural impulse to conquer our enemies? And yet yesterday Jesus told us to surrender, to turn the other cheek, to give the other our cloak and tunic, to go the extra mile. Now Jesus is telling us, love your neighbor and your enemies. He's telling us that the merely natural to love our friends is not enough. It will not suffice. His disciples are called to supernatural charity by the gift of his grace. If we are to be sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father, then we must love as the Heavenly Father has loved. Love as the Son of the Heavenly Father has taught us. We must love completely the way Jesus loved on the cross when he gave himself entirely for us and even of his enemies, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. The love that Jesus requires of his disciples is qualitatively different from that of the scribes and Pharisees. If we stuck only to the old law, we wouldn't have to love our enemies. We, would, we could be content with just loving our own. It's similar to when a parish becomes so concerned about maintaining its own members and accommodating its lukewarm members that it forgets to attract new members. When we become so preoccupied in maintaining what we have and we actually forget to evangelize through our acts of love, including bringing Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith to others, when we forget, we are not unlike the Pharisees who were content to love only their neighbors and their family members. If we are to speak of authentic evangelization and outreach, then the concept has to include loving our enemies and those who are not members of our community, even those with whom we disagree. In the first place, we do so because they too are children of God. Yes, the Heavenly Father makes the sun rise and set on them and makes rain to fall uh, on them and us alike. We are able to love them only because God has given us his grace to be his sons and daughters and thereby to love accordingly. 
But evangelization, outreach, charitable work can never be separated from the proclamation of God's love incarnate, God's love in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Finally, this antithesis concludes with these words. All the antitheses are summarized with these words, concluded with these words. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is not talking about a technical perfection, for none of us is technically perfect. We are all weak sinners in needs of God's grace. The call to perfection is a call to the perfection in love. He calls us to go beyond the old law to the new law of love. And in calling us to perfection, he uses a word which is similar to the word telos, which means goal or purpose of a thing. He uses teleoi. Our purpose or goal is perfection in love and thereby to enter into heaven, to be with God who is love forever. Jesus is saying effectively, guide your actions and your attitudes by the same intention, by the same finality, by the same goal as your heavenly father guides his actions. Jesus invites his disciples then to look at things from God's point of view. Why has God promulgated the old law and now the new law of love? The father has as the goal of his love, the salvation and unity of the whole human family. The world is much bigger than our neighbors and their needs. The needs of the human family, and regardless of their race, including the needs of our enemies, must be met. What our world needs most is, again, God's love incarnate, Jesus Christ. It is he who teaches us how to love, he who strengthens our love and raises it beyond the natural love. It is he, the divine archer, who stands behind us, teaching us, his left hand on our left hand, his chin on our right shoulder, his right hand holding the bowstring for us, how to shoot the fiery arrow of his and our common love so as to hit the goal the heart of man. We then must seek to set the world on fire with his love. I find it interesting that we see the word teleoi only once elsewhere in Matthew's gospel. It is in the story of the rich young man who has asked Jesus what he must do to have eternal life. He is no specific man, but he represents each one of us. Jesus tells him to keep the commandments. And he says, I've kept them all. And Jesus tells him then, well, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. He calls him, he asks him to be perfect in his love. And the man's face fell because he had many possessions. What must you do to have eternal life, to be happy with God forever? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We have been meditating these last few days on these antitheses, and I just wanted to kind of summarize and draw them all into one. What should we really think about? Well, Reinhold Niebuhr, in his interpretation of Christian ethics, suggested that living the antitheses was, practically speaking, impossible. Certainly, they are challenging. That's all well and good. But people would say, but Father, no one can actually do that. No one can practically do that. No one can just grow a little angry or lust just a little bit. Niebuhr contended that the Sermon on the Mount and the antitheses were written for a Christian community that expected an imminent return of Jesus. And as such, he argued that it was an interim ethic for the early church, but in the modern world, it just can't be lived in practice, at least not absolutely. What he suggests then, and we are tempted to believe him, but we won't, is that Jesus, what Jesus is saying today to us through the antithesis is, don't get too angry. Don't let lust get out of hand. Don't stretch the truth too far. Don't retaliate indiscriminately. Don't destroy enemies, but use restraint, especially in warfare. And by the way, try to love a little bit along the way. In the end, Niebuhr's interpretation boils down to this. Don't do too much of anything. That type of morality is appealing to us because it's so easy. It requires very little work on our part. But is this the type of morality that, Jesus, that the Jesus we know would actually preach? No. Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, the promise of happiness and a new order, a new way of living and a new way of loving. The antitheses are the ways for the disciples of Jesus, his community, to begin living the Beatitudes even now. Jesus promises us the fullness of the kingdom, and the kingdom of God is not an unrealistic fantasy that can never be realized. It has already begun in this community, imbued and shaped by the Spirit of God, obedient to the law of Christ, 
which is his law of love.